He will. We'll get a picture of all of us. Okay, friends. Quiet chewing. We have a remarkable, remarkable panel. And a finite amount of time. We have a hundred minutes left, and there's much to talk about. All right. Yours is this. This is you. This is me. There we go. <laughs> this um, this remarkable assortment. Okay, of, so you're not a fan of forced marriages either. Uh, will be moderated by David Welsh, who is yeah, an extraordinary either. lawyer. There are many lawyers in the house, but this one is like, special. So, Mary David Welsh, take it away. In love are kind of hard, right? <laughs> hey, good afternoon. How are you guys doing today? Uh, thank you for joining us for this luncheon uh, to talk about social equity. Social equity is something that's close to my heart, and in fact, hmm? get close. Close to everyone's heart here. <laughs> Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, great. So, social equity, what is that? And in fact, it was something that was, you know, something that was due. After decades and decades of criminalization of cannabis, plenty of people went to jail. And nothing has been in place to correct that until recently. And that's what we call social equity. The ability to create programs, to create systems in which we can allow people who are disadvantaged and communities that were disadvantaged by the drug war to get back involved in cannabis or other types of business or in the community itself. And so today I have a great panel. I'll tell you, it's probably the best panel <laughs> today and one of the best panels in cannabis of everyone here that has cares and is social equity is close to their heart. So to start, I'd like to introduce Senator Steve Bradford. Senator Bradford. is a veteran of the Senate, but also before that, the Assembly, and before that, the City Council of Gardena for 12 years, every step of the way believing in social justice, supporting social equity, and making sure to support the people that are disadvantaged getting into the cannabis business. Most recently, just this past, or last September, Senator Bradford's bill, uh, SB 1294, which is Cannabis State and Local Equity uh, program allows funding for social equity programs from the state at a local level to not only allow for social equity but to educate and train those people that need to be involved in social equity. So without people like Senator Bradford and Senator Bradford, these programs would not exist. So again, thank you Senator Bradford for joining thank us. Thank you. To Senator Bradford's left is Katrina Rosini. Katrina started on Wall Street worked in media and is the founder of Blunt TV. It is the first and currently only cannabis-centric, female-owned, multi, uh, multimedia uh, company out there. Uh, <laughs> Katrina is also very involved in assisting cannabis businesses come into compliance with their experience not only in biotech, but also on Wall Street, but her focus primarily recently has been on women businesses that are entering the cannabis space. And if anybody knows, and I've been in this industry for over a decade, there are not enough women businesses in cannabis today. And so it's great to have people like Katrina on board with such experience helping improve that. Uh, sitting to the left of Katrina, and you all might recognize this gentleman from his 16 years in the NBA, Mr. Al Harrington. Earlier, a friend said Mr. Al Harrington is a renaissance man. He excelled in the NBA, left the NBA, became a businessman, started a brand in 2011 called Viola. He named after his grandmother, who found the benefits of cannabis in her life. He is now owner of the largest black-owned cannabis business in the country. It's in six different states. Various dispensaries throughout California. It'd be hard to find a dispenser he's not in in California. And not only the product's great, is what I hear. So, <laughs> thank you, Al. And to the left is Courtney Eden, Edder. Sorry, Court. You're good, I'm here. <laughs> in 2017, Courtney started Shelf Life Distribution. It is one of the largest distribution companies in the state of California. Uh, currently, Shelf Life Distribution distributes Ocean Grown Extracts, which is Damien Marley's brand. Sticky Vape, Gold Flora, and Fruit Slabs, which is an organic, vegan, edible brand. 
It is amazing what uh, Courtney's done in just a short period of time, but also having a female-centered, female-owned business in the state and being one of the biggest and best. And we had to save the best for last, or last but not least, oh. is the father, <laughs> father of modern cannabis. Uh, that's Steve D'Angelo. Um, Steve D'Angelo, uh, for me at least, coined the term adult use. Steve has been in this business, has been a warrior for the cannabis industry for over 20 years. Steve has the dispensary Harborside, which he just took public on the Canadian Exchange. Uh, Steve has been a warrior in the sense he's been fighting the federal government since day one to legalize cannabis and much of what we live in today much of the things that we are experiencing today legalization of cannabis regulations if it weren't for steve we wouldn't have that at all so you know being last but again not least steve d'angelo It's, uh, it's an honor for me to actually host this panel because social equity is how I got into the business. A friend of mine, the reason I got into it is that a client and a friend of mine ended up going to prison for cannabis for three years. But even though that occurred, there's different ways people see it. So, I mean, I'm going to open up to the panel. And Steve, being in it the longest, how do you see social equity as it is today? <clears throat> well, you know, social... Hello? Can you hear me? No. Hello. Yes, you can now. Okay. Um, you know, for me, uh, social equity in the cannabis industry is a matter of simple, basic, restorative justice. Uh, the uh, racial disparity that we've seen in cannabis enforcement, which is a minimum of 4x for African Americans anywhere in the country, in some places, um, uh, 9 out of 10 cannabis arrests are of African Americans. We see similar numbers uh, for brown people as well. And this is not an uh, unintended consequence of the war on drugs. Uh, racial control and the displacement of, 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 of racial communities was the original animating purpose of cannabis prohibition in the first place. So if we do not create a cannabis industry that includes people and communities of color, we will be compounding decades and decades of injustice with even more decades of injustice to come on. So it's basic restorative justice. Now, a lot of the programs I'm involved in social equity have given licenses or approaching licenses for social equity applicants. And I know that's going on throughout Southern California and Northern California. Courtney, we talked, you, you had some thoughts on this. And if you could share about your ideas on social uh, equity and also just experiences you had with regard to social equity. Yeah, it was interesting. When we were preparing for this panel today, they asked about experiences, and I'm here representing a small business owner and our path that we've taken over the last four or five years as we've transitioned into regulated cannabis. Now, two experiences come to mind when spoken about social equity. One happened about three weeks ago in the hallway of the facility that we own, and I was walking down the hall, and a gentleman who works for our company, um, part of a distribution company that we acquired out of Los Angeles, also leases a facility in, Los er, er, in LA, I apologize, and we're in Orange County. And I'm walking by him and he says, we got our distribution license in Los Angeles. Keep in mind, I've worked on our application since October of 2017 in Orange County, which is a feat in itself. And I looked and I, as much as I wanted to celebrate his success, I went, oh my gosh, how did you get this done in three months? And it wasn't until the next day he came and he said, we took on a social equity partner. And in that moment, my heart was sad for the way that that conversation was communicated. That, yay, you received a license. Why was it necessary to tell me the following day that it was due to a social equity participant? Now, cannabis is in my life the way that it is because of a man who's very influential in my life, my dad. And cannabis was a conversation early on in our lives, and he is a social equity participant. He is a participant in our company. He always has been, and his participation is due to legal and general counsel, not because of the time he served. And so for me, I have this disconnect between something needs to be done when I hear the word social equity, 
and are we in the right path of doing that? And then secondary is the implementation of what we're trying to do truly being achieved. Um, and so that's, I would say, where my experience has been and why I'm here today to share some thoughts. I mean, Al, we talked, and you had some thoughts on this as well, about the process. Yeah, so, um, you know, obviously um, I didn't really pay attention to social equity until I would say probably about two and a half years ago. Um, obviously because, you know, my journey through cannabis, especially once I realized that this was something that I wanted to do and be a part of, you know, I was able to, you know, fund my start, right, without any real issues, right? And what happened was, as I was growing in the space, you know, I would be in rooms like this, and I would realize that I was the only person in the room that looked like me in the room. And after a while, I realized that that was an issue because when you think about the war on drugs and what it did to my community, you know, because, you know, if I wasn't, you know, uh, fortunate enough to play in the NBA and see the benefits of cannabis from, through my teammates and stuff like that, I would have been afraid to touch this industry just because of the way it was policed when I was young. Um, the way that, you know, my grandmother used to get, kick my aunts and uncles out the house for coming in the house smelling like reefer. You know, it was one of those things where I probably would have never touched it. But what happened was, you know, after I saw how it, uh, how it affected her life and then how it affected so many other people, you know, I realized that this plant was, you know, I've been lied to for a very long time and a lot of people have been lied to about, about this plant. So now that there's this new booming industry, you know, our community is still afraid to touch it because we're still scarred by all the lives that it affected, you know, uh, to this date. You know what I'm saying? People don't understand that this is a real thriving industry and that, you know, I feel like cannabis, if social equity is done correctly, could be a form of reparation for the black community. And, you know, I feel like if, you know, people like myself and people like us on this stage, if we don't stand up and fight, you know, for, for this opportunity, it'll be lost. And it'll be a shame because you think about industries before this where, you know, black and minorities had, you know, huge impacts, rice, sugar, cotton, the lottery, alcohol. We have no representation, no ownership in any of those industries. And, you know, my biggest thing is I don't think we can sit back and allow that to happen with this. Thank you. Good job. Senator. Well, Katrina, if you could, I, I know we talked about this as well, but I'd like to share your experiences with social equity. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm very passionate about this topic for various reasons. Uh, one being, I've worked in very male-dominated industries from Wall Street, politics, biotech, biomed, healthcare, being on board of directors. I'm always the only woman in the room. And when you think about over 50%, I think the number is around 52% of uh, consumers are women, it is insane to think about that number. So it's a missed opportunity, whether you look at it from a Wall Street perspective, an opportunity perspective, or a change perspective. So the passion I come in with is I'm an immigrant child myself. And um, having that background and being a woman and seeing all these changes and also being part of this emerging market and making history and being grateful to be on this panel and honored uh, to be sitting next to, to the OGs. <laughs> I, um, I take this pretty seriously because um, I have used my knowledge and skill set recently in helping not just women, but people of diversity uh, learn how to get into the space, be polished, and be able to communicate effectively to those VCs and investors and lock the deals. So aside from Blend TV, I'm, you know, I'm, by being in the space in this way, I'm seeing the challenges. This is a very tough, tough space. This is not an easy money-making space, which a lot of people think it is. It is extremely tough for various reasons. And so I've found that on the, and Dave and I spoke about this, on the industry side where a lot of folks are seeing challenges is the money is not reaching them. The investors are not investing in them. They're investing in the male-dominated brands. No offense, guys. And women are missing out. So they're coming to me and talking to me about why am I missing out on this? My brand's great, my product's great, my company has a trailing record, how do I get the money? 
And then on the investment side, I'm sitting with the VC guys and, and, and gals and the angels, and I'm finding that their feedback is, these folks are not polished, they don't speak the language, they don't come in with the financials to get the point across, they're coming in with fluffy pitches. So mentors are needed. A lot of work needs to be done in this space, and uh, I'm here to help. <laughs> Everything that Katrina said, I think, it really goes to what Senator Bradford has done with his bill. So, Senator Bradford, can you tell us a little about the bill that you just re you passed last year? Well, uh, SB 1294 is the Cannabis Inclusion Act uh, that encourages us to invest in women-owned, minority-owned, and disabled veteran-owned businesses in this space. And it's an area of great concern to me, not just because of cannabis, but because of who we are as a state and who we are as a nation. Our industry should look as diverse as the tapestry of this country, and many times we find it doesn't. I'm one of only two African-American senators in the state of California, a state of 40 million people. That should concern each and every one of us. But I commend the diversity in this room, both of gender and of race, because this is the most diverse audience I have spoken to on this issue in the last three years since we're talking about diversity. So you should give yourselves a round of applause because many times when I'm addressing a crowd, it's usually 80% white men. And no knock on them, but if this industry is going to survive, it has to have everyone at the table. And as Steve spoke to, the prohibition of cannabis in the 30s was to directly to incarcerate African Americans and Latinos. That's the only reason it was ever made a Schedule I drug. You know, it was no great epidemic like opioids that were killing people and all of that, you know, 70, 80 years ago. It was a way to criminalize black and brown people. But if we don't know that history and we just look at it from the lens in front of us right now, we miss all of that. So I legislate from a historical standpoint. So that's why this is critically important. There's currently $40 million on the street for social equity, but I'm here to tell you, I'm disappointed in how it's been rolled out so far. It is not touching the communities and the people that it was intended to touch. And you all should be alarmed and concerned and let your voices be heard. The first 10 million was supposed to be released on April 1st of this year. Two weeks before it hit the street, I got a list of where it was going. I immediately ran down to the governor's office and said, hold the money, which he did. Of the first 10 million, 3.5 million was going to Humboldt. And if anybody knows Humboldt, they haven't been impacted by the war on drugs. It is not a diverse community. And, 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 and they surely don't need a handout because there's billions of dollars buried in the Emerald Triangle for 20 plus years of growing cannabis in that region. So, we have to have people at the table. I've challenged uh, Lori Ajax to make sure that she has a diverse representation on her work staff that knows something about cannabis. And that's critically important. So 1294 helps create that. It created four positions on the Bureau of Cannabis um, to make sure they hire people to help with social equity. But the bill I passed this year, 595, that the governor just signed uh, last month, is fee waiver and deferrals. Again. Even when people with business ac acumen and resources are having trouble entering this market. So we're seeing what other ways can we help bridge the gap because, as you know, it is expensive to get in this business. There's over 17 different licenses that you can apply for. So we hope that fee waiver and deferral will help uh, the entree for a, a lot of folks here in this area. So, Senator, on the the bill itself, how does, it, does the money flow down to the cities? How does that work? Yeah, uh, again, uh, we're looking at how we're going to distribute this money. We want to target first those communities that have social equity programs. When 1294 passed last year, it was only four cities that had social equity programs. LA, San Francisco, Oakland, and Sacramento. Now there are over, what, 15, I believe, or so that have already uh, put ordinances in to establish and a whole lot more that are talking about it because they want the money. But I want to make sure that it's real social equity and not using what I call social lubricants, bringing black and brown and women in and front for, again, 
white male companies. I mean, really, and we got to make sure of that, and that's our greatest concern right now, that equity is real. So those are some of the safeguards that 1294 has done. I, uh, Ms. Ajax hasn't hired all of those four positions so far, and that's another issue of concern for me. Those positions should have been filled ASAP so we could really get this program rolling out. Yes. Thank you. No, and I, you bring up a great point, Senator, about people using those at a disadvantage. I, I call it uh, capitalizing on suffering. And they're using that in different programs around the state. I, I know that's something you were talking about, Courtney, earlier, how you're seeing that. And, and Steve and I were talking about that earlier as well. And Steve had a great idea. I, I sort of want to share that idea, if you could, uh, with the crowd about how we can make, and just everyone knows, we have a state fund, which Senator Bradford helped set up. That money flows down to municipalities that have their own social equity program for them to use that money. Uh, and various cities establish different types of social equity programs. For instance, in LA, they intend to issue licenses to people that own a certain percentage of a social equity business, whether it's 33%, 51%, or I think at the, at the least it's 20, or 25%. Um, but a lot of times those applications are abused. People are using it and having a front person stand in for that percentage. A social and, lubricant. Right, and, and as Senator said, social lubricants. And it's something where we, don't, at least I don't feel that that actually has accomplished the end goals. And I wanted Steve to share his idea because I think maybe that is something that was worth it. Yeah, David, I'd be happy to share that idea. Let me just briefly comment on what I call, excuse me, forced marriages. Uh, or uh, what my friend the senator calls social lubricant, which I think is an also excellent descriptive term <laughs> of what is going on, um, except maybe the lubricant part. Um, uh, so um, what happens in these situations is, is, is you have very sophisticated, very well capitalized investors who are in a business negotiation with people who have not had anywhere near the same opportunity to develop those negotiating skills and power. Um, and, and so what happens is, is you're sending folks into a situation where the same imbalance of power that we're trying to address is being replicated. So I would much rather see a situation where the general license applicants are taxed appropriately and then those funds are made available directly to the equity applicants rather than these forced marriages. Right? Um, I also think that there's a variety of other tools that municipalities can use in order to um, uh, help uh, equity applicants that help people and communities of color succeed in the cannabis industry. So one example of this, um, uh, in, uh, in San Francisco we have this uh, place called the Ferry Building. And uh, it's this very, very popular retail area, um, and it's on a pier uh, in the harbor. And uh, along that same uh, stretch are numbers of other piers that are not developed right now, that are sitting empty. Uh, and they are in prime, beautiful uh, tourist uh, retail locations with tons of foot traffic, right? So imagine if one of those piers were to be developed into a first, a training center, so people who have developed their skill set in the gray market um, uh, have an opportunity to develop the mainstream skills that they will need to be successful so they can sit at that negotiating table and be equally empowered uh, someday, right? But then uh, create a dedicated retail environment for these equity applicants and now equity graduates of the training school to be in. So imagine a ferry building that is populated by the top 10% of the graduating class from the training academy. And, and right? They, they graduate and they immediately have a spot to go into. And it's a high visibility spot and they have an opportunity can't last forever, but for a year or two to be in that spot. And the aggregate of that, of having 10, 20, 30, 40 different socially conscious equity cannabis businesses in one place that people can go to and be introduced to these brands and these experiences would be invaluable. It would be hugely popular. And it's something that cities can do just with some creative licensing. 
Uh, so that's the, the kind of thing that I think uh, is going to be necessary to tackle this problem um, that we're trying to tackle centuries of entrenched racism. And we have this magnificent opportunity to do it with the cannabis industry, but it's not an easy thing. We're, we're going to have to be creative about it and, and, and really start thinking out of the box to accomplish it. Yeah, please. <clears throat> so I, I wanted to chime in on this. Is my mic? Okay, there we go. Uh, I've sat with, as an example, executives at the Cal Asian, State Cal Asian Chamber and the Sacramento Chamber, and I've had discussions where they're discussing the same thing, the incubator approach, and um, looking at going to the private side to do the raises to be able to, to, to create these programs and where they can graduate folks. They're already somewhere in the process um, where they're trying to formulate it, um, and I'm hearing little things here and there come up. How can we get them all to come in together and create one pilot program that's successful based on obviously what you're sharing, um, which I'm 100% in agreement with, and showcase that success and what it's done for the community tangibly with numbers. And and then go from there. Because if we showcase that something is successful in multiple forms, then the growth will come. Build it and it will come, right? So how, I'm gonna throw a question out there if you don't mind. So how do we do that to where we get the right minds who are passionate about the topic and also who will back it up? Because money has to be there to build the programs, to get the first round going. What do you think on that? What's well, that? the first city that gives me a peer, I'll be right there to put the project <laughs> together. Does it have to be a peer or just a building? <laughs> hey, just give me the most prime retail uh, right. uh, foot traffic space in the city. I'll be happy. Let the negotiations begin. All right. I think, I think the biggest challenge we have is time, though. Because, you know, they're trying to issue these licenses right now. These states are trying to get this tax revenue over right now. So I don't think we have time to, like, build these buildings, get these people in, show two or three people be successful, and then go from there. You know what I mean? So I think it's what is, what is you know, I don't have a solution. Because if I did, I'd probably be a billionaire right now, right? But I think that the solution, it has to involve, you know, like you said, people that are doing it for the right reasons. Um, coming together because I think if we pool our resources together, the money will come, right? Any good business idea, good business plan can be funded, right? Um, I think it's, it's tough to fund a social equity applicant that has to have 51% ownership when they have no business acumen. Like, so that's a failure, that's a setup, you know what I mean? So, I, like, from the beginning, that was a setup. I think that, um, you know, if that's gonna be the way that they do it, I, I always feel like it should scale up. So I feel like, you know, maybe you come in, the social equity applicant starts with 30%, and as they continue to learn the businesses, there's certain milestones that they meet that they will end up getting controlling interest in the company. You know, like, so it's just, it's so many, I have so many ideas, but you know, but timing is the key, right? And we don't have time to like build these programs slowly and methodically because these licenses are being handed out next yeah. week. That's you know it. What I mean? And it's, it's building to be an incredibly competitive landscape. I mean, everybody's seeing that. So to me, the barrier of entry is already difficult. It's incredibly difficult. Um, I've been at it for a very long time. And so I think one of the things that we have to do is, one, it takes somebody of passion to want to be in this industry. Now, a social equity participant might be passionate about graphic design. They might be passionate about the flower itself. They might be passionate about growing. They might be passionate about becoming a lawyer. So why do we dictate what percentage of ownership comes with that? Proposition 215 in the state of California started as a collective, as a collaboration of people and ideas. That's exactly what the business we run is. It was people who came together that had a commonality of being passionate, and we all had different skill sets. Now, the percentage of ownership that met that skill set was conducive to allow us to form a business. My husband and I, who run that business, did not own a majority share of our business when I was working over 21 hours a day some days. So I just think that they have 
an unrealistic approach for that percentage, for understanding the barrier of entry. And I think the second problem that we run into is cannabis is hyper-localized. So you have a local jurisdiction that's creating the uh, the uh, the process for how a social equity is, a participant is going to achieve this license. Why not on a state level recognize licenses are going to be hyper localized, but keep the social equity piece maybe something that's broad throughout the state of California. So now we can have a peer collaboration and learn how to get through this together because it's just too disjointed right now. Um, and that's where I think some of the challenges lie. If I could add up to that. As Al stated, timing is critical to this process. But, and I totally embrace the incubator concept, but I think it's not the only way. Anytime you talk about social equity in the state of California or across this nation, we start as if minorities and women have a deficit, as if they need to be trained in business and as if they don't come with business acumen. And that's where we are, make that flaw and make that mistake all the time. I know plenty of people, people of color with business acumen who have the resources and are still running into barriers or entry into this industry and all industries. I did social equity in the utility space. We have something called GO 156 that now says you have to contract with women-owned, minority-owned businesses. That started some 30 years ago. I've enhanced it since I've been in the legislature. This year, we will do over $12 billion in spend, at least utilities will, with women-owned, minority-owned, and disabled veteran-owned businesses. But those utilities also started with, let's spend a million dollars to train them. You don't have to train white businesses. So why do we always have to start as if they need to be trained? And especially for those folks who were in the underground economy who made millions at this, who probably did 20 years of time. Obviously, they've been very successful at what they were doing illegally. They know how to do it now legally, so they don't need to be trained. Give them the opportunity. But, but on that same note, they were not, I'm challenging you. <laughs> on that same note, they were not facing multiple challenges that industry, the legal industry is facing. Um, Everything from lack of enforcement, uh, challenges of overtaxation, and no banking systems in place. And again, being a Schedule One drug, and I mean, these challenges are, you know, when you can't go pay your bills, how do you anticipate that these people, you know, have it equally as before? It's much easier staying in the illegal side, which is why, as you read the news, they're doing better than the legal market. Without a doubt. So, that being said, there's still, I believe that, that be, aside from the incubator side, the mentoring needs to be there to mentor folks as this industry develops, changes, grows, and eventually becomes federally legalized. But again, those folks who are being successful in this business weren't mentored by anyone. They, they figured it all out. And I'm seeing there are people with the skill set. They meet with me on a regular basis who are successful business people. I have a friend who's an attorney. Graduated from USC Law School 30-something years ago. He said, Steve, I paid for law school selling weed, but I can't get a license now. I can't get a license now. He said, I know about all the strains. I didn't even know what strains were a couple years ago. He says, I know about all the different strains that exist, but he can't get a license. And he's not looking for any handout. When I tell him every year about the legislation I passed that has funds, what he says, Steve, I don't need your money. I need an entree into this business. I need to remove some of these roadblocks that both the state and local entities, as you stated, are putting in place to make it almost impossible to enter this business. And that's what we need to address. The governmental regulatory roadblocks, and as Katrina said, the taxes too. Because now, I, why should I pay 42% even as a consumer on something I was getting from Bebe down the street, and now I, I need to walk in an establishment now and I pay 42% markup? No, I'm going to still go down and get it from the homie down the street that I've been getting it from. I, I would say your, <laughs> your attorney friend got to be more crafty. I say your attorney friend got to be more crafty because I can't say this for sure. Out of the 806 pre-vetted applicants in Los Angeles that are on the list currently, I'm not sure how familiar you are with the LA list, right? I know you are, but not everyone here. But 12% of it was black. Mm -hmm. So 
we have a list because I'm helping with the social equity and you know the social equity like you said they are smart though because they went through the list and they started vetting the top 100 people themselves and they came back and we had a meeting last week and they had pictures of these people through their Instagrams, the value of their homes, like sitting in pools, driving Ferraris, all kind of stuff. How the hell are they social equity? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's a... It, it, it's, it's, it's an incredibly complex <laughs> landscape, right? Um, you know, the, the, the communities of color are not monolithic, right? So there's lots of different kinds of folks in these communities and they have different needs. And there's plenty of black business people, Latina, Latino business people who are, have all the mainstream business skills that they, that they need. They might not know that much about cannabis, but they got plenty of mainstream business skills. But you do have folks, and I'll push back on you a little bit there, my friend, the Senator, um, who grew up in the gray market economy, right? And because, and I grew up in that same economy, right, for 30 years before I got a license, I was selling weed. And, and there were things, because we were in that market, that we just didn't have the opportunity to learn. Marketing and branding. If, if we put a brand on our product, it would be followed back to us and we'd be in prison, right? Finance and accounting. Well, that, you know, financial records were evidence, so we didn't get very good at, at, at making projections, right? Um, compliance. Well, you know, we got very, very good at evading the law, but learning how to set up an organization that knows how to, how to effectively comply with a phone book thick uh, file of regulations, it's a different skill set. And so I, I think that, um, that, at least in my experience, a, a lot of folks, I know it was true for me, as I came out of that gray market economy, there was a lot of things where I was just, boy, the learning curve was really, really steep. I got through it, but it was steep. No, I have no doubt about that, but I'm saying there is a great percentage who already have that skill set and are still running in the roadblock. So imagine if you have a prior conviction or, you know, you, with cannabis, imagine what those challenges are. Again, if you have someone who has big business acumen, who has money, and they're running into roadblocks, those folks from that great market, I mean, it's even higher. And we're just trying to find a way to, how do we level the playing field to allow as many people to participate in this market? Because if we were talking about the criminalization of cannabis, it'd be nothing but black and brown people in this room right now. But when we talk about the economic opportunity, they're few and far between. Right, and, and I think one of the things that your bill Senator, actually addresses some of these issues on financing and funding. Mm -hmm. So can you tell us a little about how that works? I, I mean, it's the devil's in the details, but we, we want to make sure, as kind of like Steve stated, that they have the skill set, they have um, the expertise, the wherewithal to be successful. Uh, again, that's why I said I, am, I embraced the incubator concept, and, and, but it's not the only way to achieve this. But one of the issues, I'm not going to speak specific, specifically to what you said, but I want to talk about the banking aspect. And, and that's the area that we really need to address. And we won't be able to wrap our arms around it until the federal government decides to act and remove it from a Schedule One. But last year, Senator Hertzberg and I introduced a cannabis banking bill. And we're going to do it again until we get it right. But it's critically important because you can't ask folks to legitimize, open up a legitimate business but then have no way to deposit this money. And, but every day, you guys as business people walk in to a state agency, the BOE, with sacks full of money, and we take it, and we walk it across the street and put it in a bank. Are we now money laundering? Yes, we are. So, but to the uh, aspects of the bill about fi financial uh, wherewithal and assistance, again, that's what those four other positions with the Bureau were also supposed to help. And with that framework, or framework te technical assistance, financial assistance, whatever little uh, uh, aid that one might need, that bill tries to address it. It's not a perfect bill, but it's more than what we had, and we're still trying to build upon it. And so, Al, you shared earlier about social equity and the, the, the list, 800, and only 12% being African American. You, you are involved in that process as well. Uh, you, you, t you shared with me earlier that you are mentoring and helping establish businesses in that space. Can you share a little about your experiences on a local level with licensing? Yeah, so um, a good friend of mine, um, you know, ran into me at Jamba Juice, 
in uh, Woodland Hills, and he was just telling me about, you know, social equity, breaking it down to me here in L.A. And, you know, he's from Watts or whatever, and, you know, his group, um, they're called GGC, and they do a lot of stuff with, like, giving back, with feeding the homeless and, you know, giving kids, you know, s school supplies and different things like that. So that was the first thing that attracted to me is the, all the good that they were doing in the community. But then he's the one that really woke me up about, you know, this being a potential way of reparations, you know, for the community. And we started the process. So we started with 60 people from their neighborhood. Like, and when I say, like, these people were from the neighborhood, like, I was cash apping 60 people five bucks to get to my office so that we could have our first meeting. Like, so these people like really came from nothing, nothing. And, you know, we started the process of, you know, vetting them just to make sure like, you know, that they met the requirements that we had. And we started like a workshop pretty much on every Thursday where we just started teaching them the process of like track, uh, POS systems. Uh, you know, taxes, a little bit of everything. Um, you know, most of them didn't, didn't never use, didn't have email addresses. It was just crazy just to see, like, for it to be 2019 and a lot of people to not have a lot of these things. So once we started this process, um, we had another guy come in that was in charge of getting them through this pre-vetting process. So my company paid, um, you know, $5,000 for uh, all 60 people. So we paid 300 grand, um, you know, to start this pre-vetting process. Once we got done with it, we ended up with 32 people. So once we had the 32 people, what was the next challenge? The challenge was they expected social equity applicants, people that were, came from nothing, from the neighborhood, had no education, just came home from jail and all these other things to be able to, they had to have control over real estate. So I'm like, <laughs> I'm like I gotta find 32 people, gotta find real estate, they have no uh, credit. Um, so obviously that was a huge challenge, right? And then when I didn't realize how big it was uh, with all these other groups, um, the other, whatever, 770 other people that we were competing with, they had locked up a lot of the real estate. So throughout that process, we were only able to find eight buildings, right? And what I was able to convince all of my um, applicants to do was to take a village approach, right? So I said, okay, we only have eight people but we're gonna definitely have more than 30 jobs available. So we'll make sure that everyone here gets jobs. And you know, we even, you know, some of our tier two applicants, we even have deals with them where, you know, we'll be able to give equity to some of these other applicants as well. So, um, so now we're just in the waiting process like everybody else. You know, um, we had, you know, three applicants in the top 150, all the rest of them are in like the three to 400 number or whatever. So. Now, you know, the, the mayor is right now going through an audit of the process, and he said it's gonna take him anywhere from 20 to 30 days. So now we got to see what happens with that to see if the program is gonna move forward or not. But, you know, my, my solution is to vet all 800 people, because when you think about it, um, there was anywhere from five to 7,000 illegal dispensaries here in California, and it was a booming industry. So why would, they, why would the industry suffer if we have you know, we already have 160 or 176 uh, pre-ICOs and we add another, let's say 800, even though all 800 won't get through because of they're not social equity. So, and, and when you think about a lot of these people, um, some of the people that did have some resources, they've been holding their properties for over two years. Like, you know, I've, I've had meetings with people and they're crying. Like, I have, I put my, I've, I put my house up to be able to continue to pay for this. And it's really sad when you sit into a, when you sit in a room with these people. And this is all. This is their only shot of a better life. You know what I'm saying? Like that's what people we have to realize is like when we talk about social equity, like and the people that are true social equity, like this is their only chance of making them giving themselves a better life. And we have to take that serious. We have to take it really serious. And we have to find a way to support these people and and and, and support these programs to make them work. And, um, you know, so I'm waiting with my 38 people. Either way, you know, if we get eight, everybody's going to, you know, eat at the end of the day. And I'm, I'm proud to say that. Yeah. The, challenge, the challenges you're sharing, you want to add to that, those folks who are. And we're, one thing, I don't know if folks are, are familiar with this. I want to say something that's very interesting. I, 
local jurisdictions all have different rules and different application processes. And a lot of them cost anywhere from 10,000 to, I don't know, I've heard 100,000. Mm -hmm. I mean, no two sound like they were alike. So you add that to the variable of confusion challenges. And then on top of that, Prop, post Prop 64 passing, most people don't realize they think California is recreationally legalized now. Well, roughly, and correct me if I'm wrong, Senator, 30, roughly 30% 30 of jurisdictions have allowed it in their communities. What that means is about roughly 70% of jurisdictions today do not allow licenses in their communities. Now, they are opening up one by one, little by little. But as this, these doors open up, Listen to the challenges we're talking about up here. It's going to continue to grow unless we fix and have the right solutions for long-term fixes and really figure out how to, to resolve this if we really want to make a difference in the social equity space. That's key. Uh, what you're seeing right now is a real hodgepodge approach to this. Uh, what Al was describing is the city of LA's process. And I just spent an hour and a half last week talking with Kat Packard on how we fix this because she's working night and day to m try to make it right. But where the city of LA erred in this, instead of looking at small geographic areas that were impacted by the war on crime, uh, increased arrest records, they looked at entire zip codes. And within that tired zip code, you capture a whole lot of people who were never impacted, but, and it should have been a far narrower screen than what they did. And that's part of the challenge too. And then as Al stated, after, after the first series of license go out, they're gonna do a reset and you're gonna have to reply again. I says, no, why don't you use those folks who are already in queue, who've already qualified, but you're gonna have to re-up again and go through that process again. And who wants to continue to do that with the possibilities of you not being selected or given a license so she and I are trying to work this out I'm talking with uh, some of the elected officials in LA because it is a problem and, and, it, and it's not the you know what we hoped when we talked about social equity in a city the size of LA they're running into a whole lot of roadblocks and we have to fix it and it's not right now the the program that I would model if I was neighboring jurisdictions and looking to roll out a social equity program and as uh, Katrina stated there are, the majority of cities don't want cannabis, no shape, form, or fashion, and that's part of my challenge. I represent the 35th Senate District. I represent cities from Inglewood all the way to San Pedro. I have Torrance, Hartthorne, Lawndale, Carson, Compton in my district, and the majority of those cities, Gardena, where I grew up and where I live, Gardena doesn't want cannabis. Torrance doesn't want cannabis. Hartthorne doesn't. I mean, and you have to work with it. And I, as I've been making presentations to mayors and council, I says, if you say no to it legally, it's going to be in your community illegally anyway. So let's find a way. But many times, local elected officials only see cannabis in two forms, growing and selling. And as we're trying to tell folks, there's 17 other licenses. You need testing laboratories. And that's what I'm trying to encourage people to do. We don't have enough testing laboratories here in California. Open up a testing laboratory. Whether you want to be in the medicinal or uh, recreational use, you need to, uh, a commercial kitchen to cook the product if you're creating edibles. And I'm, I'm trying to encourage folks to go in that space as well. As someone stated earlier, marketing and advertising, packaging, all of that, delivery, those are all different aspects of this industry that are, uh, are available to folks. But we have to broaden our horizon and our view on what those opportunities look like. I want to take a moment. I know, uh, Al, you, you have to leave. You, you sort of fit us in your schedule today. Thank you so much. I wanted to give everyone the opportunity before Mr. Harrington leaves to see if there's a question out there for him. We'll do Q&A for the rest of the panel after this. Yes.
Right. So for our company, we're budgeting a million dollars per store. Um, because you're right, I mean, you know, it's funny, these programs are just so funny, $30,000. That don't even cover your attorney fees. You know what I mean? <laughs> so, you know, for us, you know, we, 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 we earmarked a million bucks. Um, and the reason why is because, you know, obviously you have a burn, um, you have to build out the store, you have to get all the insurance, all the other stuff, you have to stock the shelves. So, um, you know, I, we kind of conservatively, we think it's about a million dollars, you know, to be able to, you know, uh, build out a, a good store, a good solid store. So my husband and I were looking at the grants that have been issued last night to 10 different communities, starting from 1.8 million down to 100,000, I believe, in the city of Palm Springs. And we looked at each other and we said, what do you think you could start with 1.8? in Oakland. It was 3.5 million shared between Los Angeles and Oakland itself. So the way that I see it is Al mentioning 800 applicants and how many are actually going to go through. I feel the approach right now is going, I don't know if it's going deep or wide. It's not going wide enough with as many people as we can affect and bring along. It's not going deep enough as far as the dollars that are available to these businesses. So I think we have a challenge on, on width and depth um, just to piggyback on that. Well, one reason that, that, that the costs are so high in this process is, is, is so difficult is because of the overall failure of cannabis legalization in the state of California. Um, you know, in my shop, Harborside, following the legalization that, that everybody expected, all the pundits said, would bring a at least 30% increase in the legal market, 51% of the people who used to come into my shop don't come in there anymore. I, I track it. I know who they are. Now, fortunately, some other people have started coming in, but that 51% was medical cannabis patients who could not afford the taxes in my shop and have now returned to the underground, untested uh, marketplace that, that, you know, we created all this in the beginning uh, to protect them. And then on the other hand, you have um, the vast majority of California growers who have not been able to get through the licensing process. And so the combination of the consumers who can't afford the legal system and the growers who also can't afford to get into the legal system has re-energized California's unregulated market. Uh, and it's been a complete failure. Um, and so that is a, a problem that's impacting every aspect of the, of the cannabis industry. And, one which we're hoping the legislature is going to take some measures. And, and I totally agree with it. I, if you ask me if I had to grade our cannabis um, industry right now in California, I would probably give it a, a C minus because it's failing greatly. Again, that consumer who needs that product from a medicinal standpoint of because we now tax it where, the, again, they, they won't go into the established retail establishment. But at the same time, you have legislators who know nothing about this industry. You have regulators who know nothing about this industry, and that's why I'm seeing we need to hire people with experience, regardless of what their background was, regardless if they did time. Bring those folks in to be the experts here, because I sit here and I tell you, we see 2,000 bills on average a year. If any legislator states that they're an expert on all 2,000 bills, they're lying to you. And I know what I know, and I know what I don't know. That's why I, I, I was just telling Steve earlier, Number one book in my house is the Cannabis Manifesto, Steve D'Angelo's book. And it's a great read if you haven't read it. And I learned more about this industry. And I've learned more about it from people like yourselves who have come into Sacramento, have come to my district office and educated me on it because we do need to fix it. If we want it to be successful, if we want it to be the, the opportunity that we all hope for when we pass Prop 64, then we, you know, it needs everybody's involvement and don't trust legislators to be the experts on it. So I, I know you've got to take off right now, so I want to thank you for being on the panel. We're going to stay here and ask and talk more, but I, I want, if we get a round of applause for Mr. Al Harrington. Thank you guys. You know, we talk about the illegal market, and I think, Steve, you, you brought up a good point. Uh, Courtney, what is your thoughts on that? The illegal market, how it affects social equity in general. How the <laughs> illegal market affects, the, oh, sorry, was no, that for you, Courtney? I, 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 we can speak together, how about that? Um, see, thank you very much. 
it's there and it's present. Um, I wouldn't be here without my husband, so that's why I reference him a lot. Um, it is definitely a plant that changed his life and he changed my life, so that's why I reference him a bit. Um, when we go into communities that we have dispensaries in, oftentimes we'll find ourselves in an Uber and I'll say, hey, what dispensary do you support locally? And I tell you, nine out of 10, if not 10 out of 10 times, they say, oh, I actually still get it from my buddy down the street. Those taxes are too high. And I'm like, oh, this is devastating. So that to me is really where it shows up. We can find ourselves in a world that's cannabis regulated and that's all we know is other licensees. And then you really pick your head up and you ask around and you realize how many people just simply can't afford that. So it's cheaper for me to buy it from my buddy. Um, I don't know what you do about that. I don't know. Something, I hope. Steve, you had some thoughts as well. Well, you just look, you know, when you have these onerous, onerous regulations, it reduces the pool of, of large of the pool of businesses that can get through that maze. OK, and then that affects all businesses, including equity applicants. So it shrinks opportunity massively. I mean, we have in California, instead of growing the legal market by the 50 percent, at least we should have grown it by now, it has slipped um, uh, by like 30 percent. It's, it's crazy. So it just, it, it steals opportunity from everybody. No, I want to open up for more questions. I mean, you guys have a wealth of knowledge here. So I'd love for you guys to ask some questions. Yes. Senator Brever, you want to comment on that? I, 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 first, uh, the legislature didn't write the proposition, didn't write Proposition 64. Governor Brown had a lot of input on it, but again, one of the challenges, as I tried to explain earlier, is taxation. We have a great, I have a great concern about that. But again, you have legislators who don't, but I understand that, but you have legislators that don't understand your story and understand the compelling story of medical use individuals. They just still want to see it as some illegal drug, and we have to change that paradigm. I, I, know, I understand yeah. that. Are there yeah. any other comments on this? And, well, and that's why, and, and to I'm, set it, I'm, sorry, I don't mean to compete no, with Steve. You can take it. <laughs> um, I want to I wanna back Senator Bradford, I've, I've gotten to know him over this past year, sitting down with him as um, the, bill, the bills and the laws and whatnot at the Capitol. Um, and he has been one of the most solid voices at the state Capitol. Uh, and I, I mean, it hasn't been easy for him. I'm sorry, I'm speaking on your behalf here. Um, I've witnessed it myself. Um, he is absolutely correct. I have sat down with other legislators who don't understand this space who are scared of it. It is fear. It is fear, bottom line fear. Now here's what we can do as empowered individuals. We can share our comments, our voices with our 
legislators in our communities, right? Through They have local offices, they have Sacramento. Combine your voices, take your clients who are struggling, tell their stories to, the, to your legislators. They listen, they have to listen, they need those votes. This is why it's important that next time it's election time, vote for somebody better. Steve, do you have a comment? Uh, uh, and maybe don't vote. even wait for Show next up. election. Recall elections and petitions are, are a great tool too. They've been tremendously effective in the past. Recall elections. There was a pending question. Yes. <laughs> Any other? Yes, sir. Yes. <laughs> As he takes the plate. Questions about the drug facts on the product and whether there's regulation behind on it. CBD. Now there are regulations that are out there, and I, I can talk to you afterwards about those different regulations on the drug facts. It, are there any other questions regarding social equity uh, with regard to cannabis? And I, yeah, yes. Well, um, that's not necessarily a cannabis question, and I appreciate, no, I appreciate it, because I chair Senate Banking, and one of the things I've been challenging our banks, our financial institutions, we have something called CRA, Community Reinvestment Act. Banks control trillions of dollars that they have an obligation to invest back in our communities, and they're not doing that. And that's one of the conversations that I've had since I've been Senate Banking, and will continue to have ongoing uh, conversations of how do we reinvest those dollars because we're not holding these financial institutions to, to, to their responsibilities of reinvesting again in those impacted communities not only on war on drugs that just been neglected for the last 40 years. But that's what CRA was passed a number of years ago to force those banks to reinvest that money back in those communities. In most communities now, you can't even find a bank on the corner. I mean, that's why you have all the pop-up check cashing, online lenders, title loans, because banks have walked away from those underserved minority communities. We have three million unbanked Californians just here alone. And we're trying to have that conversation. Congresswoman Maxine Waters, who chairs uh, federal banking, she's challenging those banks to reinvest those dollars back into these communities. So what I want to do is take a moment to give the panelists closing call. Or you have a question? Please ask her.
we have with this afternoon. We do know what we're doing and what the lead out. Um, but who do we hold accountable when you know the cities? I just received an email that showed that LA would give 1.8. When they've been telling us for years that we're going to have grants, we're going to have financial help, we're going to have these different workshops set up, and they lured us out from the darkness from doing the illegal and illicit marketing, and now that we came into the light, we have no help. We have no means of financial help, no means of everything that they promised them to take the hit and come into what it is that they're doing. How do we hold them accountable? I've emailed, I've emailed different legislators, I've talked to Pat Packer, I've talked to everyone that we're supposed to talk to. When does the action actually kick in? I, I wish I had the answer to that because that's the biggest challenge for me as well as a legislator who's secured $40 million, and it sounds like a lot of money, but it's a drop in a bucket. But I, where I saw that $40 million going out, I was concerned because it wasn't going, as I stated earlier, to the communities that I intended for it to impact. And so it's an ongoing fight, not only with the Bureau, but with local elected officials, and that's why I'm trying to get us all to come back together and, and huddle up and fix this problem because it's real. And if we don't wrap our arms around it and address it in a real meaningful way, you're going to have the Wild Wild West again with illegal operators. And, and that's not what Prop 64 was about allowing the legal market to con continue and flourish. And as Steve stated, we haven't seen an uptick in revenues for the state of California and, and the promised legalization of cannabis because, again, we have put too many roadblocks to entry for individuals. So. The hodgepodge approach doesn't work, but that's how the proposition was drafted to allow those individual cities and communities d to define their own program and decide whether they want cannabis or not. Even though it's legal statewide, you know, our, the proposition didn't usurp local government's authority. So it's, I it's get an only easy answer there. I want to get two more questions in. Question? Uh, that's up to the individual cities who have social equity programs and how they market that. I, I'm, I'm not aware of how Long Beach is doing it, or, but I know from a state level, again, there were supposed to be four positions that were hired under the Bureau of Cannabis Control to help marshal this out in a very comprehensive way, and they have yet to do that. So uh, I would say also look at the Bureau's website. Uh, uh, my website only speaks to the legislation that I have passed, but it doesn't get to the granular aspect of how it's rolled out in those communities because, again, those cities have their own, you know, individual programs that they want to implement. But, again, I'm going to be as vocal as I have been and will continue to be vocal if I see this money not being utilized in the manner in which I intended to for it to be because as I met with Jerry Brown last year when he agreed for the 10 million and then when I met with Governor Newsom this year and he had uh, provided to additional 30 million this shouldn't be one-time funding this should be ongoing funding but I don't want it to be ongoing funding if it's not going to the communities and individuals who need this money so we will work on trying to figure out the best way to message that but it's up to those individual communities right now and to add on to what the senator just said I couple of things. Obviously, the local jurisdictions, contact your local jurisdiction to get information from them. Uh, additionally, uh, the Bureau, the State Bureau, Cannabis Bureau, um, has launched a campaign called Hashtag WeedWise, and their whole campaign has been around, I think it was about a million, 1.7 million dedicated to this advertising to communicate various things across the state to the public as well as to industry so that you know you can follow the news and and what's happening so um so that's pretty much all that i'm aware of when it comes to the state side too so last question in the back
I think that's the challenge of everybody here in this room that's committed to this industry, to be the voice. I mean, uh, I as an elected official can't do it by myself. Steve can't do it. Katrina can't do it. The people on this panel can't do it alone. This is what these discussions are all about, making sure that we take the message out to the community, let them know what programs are available, what kind of you know, roadblocks are out there, and how do we fix it? Because your voice is needed here, folks. Again, if you leave it up to legislators, we're going to get it wrong most of the time. You will. I mean, whether it's state, federal, or local, we're going to get it wrong. We need to hear from the folks who do this for a living, who are trying to do it for a living, who understand those challenges and what will make it easier. Like I say, Steve D'Angelo is probably one of the best resources you can have. He's been in this industry far longer than anybody I know. And again, far too often, they leave it up to us as like, oh, you're a senator, so you must be the smart. No, we're not. So let's trust those folks. But again, let your voices be heard to let your local elected officials, your state, and your federal elected officials know what you need, what you want, and what is lacking here. Steve, did you want to say anything? Well, I, I, I do, uh, because I want to, this it touches on uh, a topic that we haven't addressed yet, but for me it's, it's a part of social equity, and that speaks to all of the people who are still in prison on cannabis charges. Um, the majority of them there's, we, we, that we know of, and it's hard to track, at least 40,000 nationwide, the majority of them in states that have in some way reformed their cannabis uh, laws, uh, many of them in states like California, Colorado, where cannabis is, is completely legal. Around 50 prisoners that we know of uh, in, in the United States are serving life sentences for cannabis crimes. That means they will die in prison if we don't get them out. And so uh, I think that when we think about communities that have been traumatized by the war on drugs, one of the very first things that we need to do is go into communities, hold expungement clinics, um, uh, interact with people whose path forward in a variety of different ways is being blocked by their criminal convictions and work on getting them expunged. Um, uh, and a shameless plug here, for an organization which is dedicated to doing that, which I founded several months ago, The Last Prisoner Project. Um, if you'd like to learn more about it, please uh, come up to me and I'll, I'll give you some information afterwards. Uh, my opinion, the, the, the mission of the cannabis reform movement will not be complete until every single one of our prisoners comes home and has a viable pathway to rebuild their lives. So, and with that, and a very good point, I want to thank you guys uh, for being here, sharing your time for lunch, and also thank you so much to the panelists today, sharing this experience with something that's so important to us, social equity in the cannabis space. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Hi.